Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. In a few minutes, a conversation with an FAA employee who blew the whistle on literally thousands of fraudulent certifications of airline mechanics. But first, the World Bank touts itself as a vital source of assistance to developing countries, a worthy social justice mission. But critics charge that beneath the gloss of its multinational facade simmer long-standing racial inequities. With us to discuss this are National Examiner reporter Wamara Mwini and B. Edwards, International Director of the Government Accountability Project. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Uh, B., your organization published a report recently on racial discrimination at the bank. Can you tell me about that report? Well, the report began as a response to a whistleblower who came to us from the bank uh, claiming that there was a problem of racial discrimination there and pointing out the fact that it was very difficult to document because the bank itself did not publish figures on uh, its personnel categorized by grade and, and by race. And in response to that, we began to do the research that we could do. A number of people gave us documents that the bank itself had produced showing problems of racial discrimination over the years and uh, we compiled them into a report and drew the conclusions, summarized the conclusions really that the bank itself had come to and released that report in June. Uh, the report showed a couple of, of astonishing things. One was that of a professional um, staff of over 3,500 people, a thousand of whom are U.S. nationals, only four or fewer were black African Americans. Uh, and, and that is a percentage figure that doesn't f even register as a rounding error on the, on the personnel totals. Um, we also saw that if you were Afro-descendant, if you were black African-American or African, you were about 30 percent less likely to be a manager and you were much more likely to be hired at the lower end of the salary range for the grade uh, in which you were recruited. Well, what does the bank say about this? Well, uh, we asked the director of the uh, Office of Diversity Programs to please review the paper and if we had anything uh, included there that didn't accurately represent the situation that she should tell us what it was and she should help us to correct it. She simply wrote back to say that our report was based on anecdotal evidence and that it was, it was uh, replete with errors. I wrote back to her again asking her to please correct uh, any errors that she found and there was no response from her. When reporters called the bank uh, asking specifically about the low number of Afri black African American professionals, the bank told them that the figure was incorrect and that the bank in fact employed a hundred or so African American professionals. When we looked into it, we found that it was a question of semantics and that the bank was misrepresenting really what everyone understands as a definition of African American. Well, who were they including that you wouldn't include? They include white Africans primarily from Rhodesia, former Rhodesia or South Africa, who work at headquarters and who've lived in the United States for a period of years, and so they've become naturalized. And so essentially they're including white African Americans in that number. Well, the bank says it's using colorblind criteria in its hiring practices, uh, and that because of that, uh, they aren't discriminating. They are including whomever fits those criteria, meets those criteria. Isn't that fair? Well, it doesn't appear so in that uh, there are, we're 
are living in Washington, D.C. The bank is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is home to Howard University, which is the flagship institution of the historically black colleges and universities in America. Uh, the, the Office of Diversity Programs told us they had an active outreach and recruitment effort at Howard and at historically black colleges and universities in the United States. But when we checked with Howard and we checked with the historically black colleges in the mid-Atlantic region, in the career development uh, offices, we found that there had never been any specific effort by the World Bank to recruit their graduates. And for a current bank employee seeking a promotion or for a job applicant to the bank, who feels as though they have been discriminated against based upon race. What legal recourse is there? That was one of the more disturbing findings uh, in the paper. The, the, one of the, the worrisome characteristics of the bank when you encounter some kind of deficit like this is that it has legal immunities and therefore it's not subject to the jurisdiction of national courts either in the U.S. or in any country where it operates, that immunity is predicated on the assumption that there is a functioning, adequate internal justice system at the bank. That justice system is represented in the highest instance by the bank's administrative tribunal. So we looked at tribunal decisions in cases of, discrim of racial discrimination. And the first thing we found was that in 12 years, only 21 cases of discrimination had been brought to the tribunal. I guess you could argue that people don't feel discriminated against or they would have brought these cases. Well, when you find that there are bank studies that show a pervasive problem of racial discrimination, but you find that no one is bringing cases of discrimination to the tribunal, or very few people are, I think you would come to the opposite conclusion, which would be that people who experience racial discrimination have no confidence in the tribunal as a remedy. And in fact, when we looked at the decisions of the 21 cases, there had not been a single case where there was a finding of discrimination, despite the fact that internal policy studies show that the bank recognizes racial discrimination as an issue. Umar, you recently reported on an incident or a couple incidents at the bank that suggest that there isn't necessarily the kind of vigilance in the administration at the bank to suppress uh, racist behavior. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, certainly um, after reviewing the GAP report, um, I wanted to interview some people that were there and get a sense of what the feeling is to be an African American who is in the World Bank who is subject to some of this discrimination that the report covers. So uh, what I found uh, out was that there was an incident where uh, there was some spray painting within the building in an area that, you know, within, within the legal department where people would see uh, people who were walking through this area pretty frequently in the main building. And, uh, you know, using the N-word, uh, you know, this kind of uh, derogatory uh, language is very offensive. And I think it demonstrates that clearly within the bank there's an environment that tolerates this. Uh, well, some individual, it could be a, a, a rogue individual who spray painted on the walls. In what sense can you hold the bank responsible for that? I think that uh, within the Office of Diversity Programs, uh, what, I, what I discovered in, in my interviews and, and just general research was that they don't have a, an opportunity to really take action uh, in terms of hiring and firing. So, in a sense, the person who was involved in this incident uh, clearly wasn't fired. And I think when you have a diversity department that has real uh, teeth, has an opportunity to step in in these situations and make decisions outside of a tribunal, which is a group of people that have generally been uh, handpicked and put together to make a decision, this Office of Diversity uh, does not have uh, the full uh, strength to take action in these situations, which leaves employees feeling helpless in the sense that although there was a release from the Human Resource Department, that basically there was no disciplinary action. Um, in what sense are the bank's racial practices similar to those or different than uh, the practices of other international institutions in your experience? 
I think the bank's uh, tribunal system is set up uh, to review all a variety of different cases, different situations. Uh, the, uh, the problem with this is that without having uh, outside recourse, people go through the tribunal and, and basically if they don't get uh, a judgment, then it's, it's as if something had never happened. It's as if their claim then uh, goes on their record as an accusation, which suggests that there's something wrong with that person versus something wrong within the system. So there, there needs to be a greater uh, check, checks and balances to uh, protect these employees who have the courage to stand up and say, I was discriminated in this situation and uh, I, I deserve better treatment. And also within the system, there is a habit of hiring people on a contractual basis. So the majority of African Americans are on a month-to-month -month basis. So that doesn't give you a sense of uh, job security. So already at a disadvantaged position, you're looking uh, to get some kind of resolution, but you're also thinking, I might lose my job. And this has to have some kind of negative public relations impact on the bank which holds itself out as a kind of bastion of multi-ethnic solidarity and working on behalf of the developing world. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing any public relations impact on the bank? Well, the gentleman I spoke with within the media relations department was, was very adamant to try and figure out exactly what I was writing. And uh, I could understand a certain level of curiosity, but I think his was, uh, was even more far-reaching he wanted to influence what I was putting in my story to make it sound like the bank was doing a better job at, at, at diversity than they actually were. The problem with this, and, and I've seen this in other organizations, is that the first step to creating a, a more diverse uh, environment, work environment, is basically to admit that the program isn't going as well as, as had planned or as expected. So without coming out and saying, we need to improve this, how can an organization take steps to make it better for African Americans who, to feel more welcome? Sort of like a 12-step program. You've got to recognize you the problems first. You have to recognize first. the problems first, mm -hmm. exactly. And uh, without that, mm -hmm. absent of that recognition and, and being in a combative uh, state of mind as that individual I spoke with was, it creates a real uh, uncomfortable feeling, uh, certainly after I finished the story and my interviews with more than 10 black, black African-American, uh, African employees at the bank, uh, you just feel a, a sense of fatigue because you are dealing with, you're confronted with all of their anxieties and their fears in talking to you about this issue. B, we just have a very short amount of time left. I'm wondering, beyond the public relations aspect of this, if, for instance, there were an effective anti-discrimination policy at the bank and true diversity in its hiring policy of professionals and the complexion of the organization actually represented the people it was speaking on behalf of, would it make a difference in the bank's policies and practices? Well, hopefully it would. I think one thing that, that we do know about racial discrimination and hiring practices, that is, if you are one or two people of the discriminated group and you're in a, even if you're in a position of some authority and power, there's very little you can do because you're such a minority. If the bank were to cast a wider net and pull in people from different socioeconomic groups, different kinds of educational backgrounds, different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, then there might be a real sea change in the kinds of policy debates and the orientation of the bank as it tries to uh, realize its mission in the developing world. Okay, well many thanks to the National Inquir Examiners, excuse me, uh, many thanks to the National Examiners of Umara and Winnie uh, and Gaps B. Edwards for helping us better understand the chasm between the rainbow image of the World Bank and its reality. Hopefully Gaps report will help move the bank closer to realizing its stated policy of non-discrimination and diversity. When we return, blowing the whistle on bogus certifications of airline mechanics.
Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, and with me is Gabe Bruno, who knows a thing or two about uh, air safety. We're going to talk with him today about that. Welcome, Gabe, to Whistle you. Where You Work. Uh, Gabe, where are you from? Well, I grew up in uh, New York City, in the mm -hmm. Bronx. Mm -hmm. And how did you find yourself uh, at the Federal Aviation Administration? Well, um, uh, to give you the uh, Reader's Digest version, I was always interested in aviation ever since I was a, a little kid. Actually, there's pictures of me about three years old pointing at airplanes, you know, and that sort of thing. So airplanes are always something that I, was, I had a very uh, deep interest in. Um, to make a long story short, uh, you know, when Vietnam happened, uh, I wound up uh, getting drafted in the big draft bush of uh, August of 1966. Uh, served two years, got out of the Army, um, and used the GI Bill to uh, go to flight school, finally to uh, be able to afford what I wanted to do. Uh, from that point on, I worked as a flight instructor for a number of years and a uh, charter pilot and uh, uh, provided pilot services to various corporations and so forth. And um, at that point in time, uh, the, uh, there really weren't uh, very many airline jobs available. The industry was quite a bit different than it is today, so I'm talking about the early 70s. Uh, so um, I had an opportunity to uh, get hired by the FAA as an inspector. I took that opportunity, and um, that's what I did. I spent a good part of my professional life uh, working for the FAA as an inspector and as a manager over uh, flight standards offices. And in 1996, you were assigned to a pretty important task. Uh, that was uh, the time of the ValueJet crash that killed 110 people, and there was a merger of ValueJet with AirTran, and you were assigned to oversee that merger, right? That's correct. What happened was, the, as you know, the accident happened in 1996, May of 1996. Um, and as a result of that accident, a number of things uh, took place. Uh, there was a very extensive, obviously, N NTSB investigation into the causes of the accident. The Department of Transportation Inspector General uh, launched an investigation to ask questions and find out what happened inside the FAA. How is it that they could find so many deficiencies in terms of oversight of that airline uh, that the FAA really was kind of uh, clueless as to what happened? And then uh, there was also uh, the FAA ran something called a 90-day safety review. And the 90-day safety review was designed to identify all these deficiencies and then come up with recommendations to supposedly put in place a system so that we wouldn't have another value jet happen. Well, <clears throat> when the crash happened, uh, the, uh, our Atlanta field office had uh, oversight and responsibility for the uh, uh, value jet uh, certificate. Uh, after all of these investigations and the 90-day safety review, uh, ValueJet was put under a consent order to operate. And what that means is that they were allowed to operate in a very limited mode with very strict uh, guidelines on what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do. Well, during that phase, uh, the decision was made between uh, ValueJet and AirTran, which was at the time a small airline down in Orlando, Florida, they were operating, I believe, 11 737s. It was a small, small operation. So ValueJet um, had a lot of money, had a lot of cash. Um, and uh, AirTran was a nice little operation, but they were in need of cash, so it seemed like a natural uh, marriage between the two. ValueJet needed a new name. AirTran wanted a bigger operation. Exactly, exactly. So uh, when that happened, um, uh, when that decision was made, I was notified that they were going to take the responsibility of the whole operation, the larger operation, and move it out of Atlanta and put it down in Orlando, Florida, which is the office, the flight standards office that I was managing at the time. And I was going to be given the responsibility to oversee this merger. So, well, it was my job. So I said, sure, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> it was a rather complex undertaking. But uh, so that's what I did. And that's how I wound up getting involved with the uh, the ValueJet AirTran merger. And did the FDA conduct a, a proper investigation of the merged airline? Well, the, um, do you mean after the merger? Yeah. Um, what happened was um, we put together a rather extensive merger plan because of all of the issues that surrounded ValueJet. We took the findings of the 90-day safety review. We took the findings of the NTSB for causal factors. We took the findings of the Inspector General's office that said these were the things that were wrong with the FAA, <clears throat> and we uh, put together a merger plan to address each and every one of those issues and findings. 
we had a plan that was rather extensive. It had about 300 line items on it. The completion of the merger from the FAA side took about 11 months to do. So <clears throat> we went through all of these issues. We made sure that there were no issues left unaddressed in terms of concerns. There are things that were contributing factors to the problems that had existed at ValueJet. And when we did that, when we completed it, um, I reported uh, back to FAA headquarters. I said, uh, okay, we've got the merger complete. Uh, we're going to, we have now what's, what I termed as a clean certificate. In other words, they, the new operation, the new merge operation was in full compliance with the regulations. And uh, I said, okay, now it's time for the FAA to ante up and provide resources to maintain oversight of the certificate. Well, this was a very important point because this was one of the things that was determined uh, to be a contributing factor to the original ValueJet crash. The FAA was not providing proper oversight of the certificate. The operator was playing kind of fast and loose with the regulations. Uh, there were a lot of things that were found to be in non-compliance with. And the FAA even had uh, inspectors assigned oversight responsibility for that carrier that didn't have the proper background and credentials and qualifications. Tell me who Anthony St. George is. Well, uh, Anthony St. George is a um, uh, designated pilot examiner who was in the central Florida area. And what that means is that the FAA had designated him to, I'm sorry, not pilot examiner, a designated mechanic examiner. And the FAA had designated him to be able to conduct uh, mechanic exams and then issue uh, mechan FAA mechanic certificates uh, to the applicants if they pass the exams. Well, um, what happened was uh, Mr. St. George actually ran a, a criminal enterprise and was issuing certificates with, that, with little to no testing, uh, just as long as the fee was paid. So the word got out through the industry, and there were uh, applicants coming from uh, not only all over the country, but uh, actually all over the world. We even had uh, people come from the Middle East to so-called buy these certificates. Well, we did the investigation in conjunction with the uh, Inspector General's office, um, found that this, in fact, was what Mr. St. George was doing. Uh, he was prosecuted um, uh, for defrauding the government. Uh, he was sentenced to uh, two and a half years in federal prison. And that left, of course, um, a number of these bad certificates. How many would you say were out there? Well, there's almost 2,000 of them was the best estimate we came up with at the time. So these were mechanics who really weren't uh, uh, certified to be doing the jobs that they were doing uh, to keep the plane safe. That's correct. They were never tested to the, uh, to the proper certification standards. They were given the certificates solely because they paid a fee. So that left us with the, uh, with the quandary of, okay, now we have all of these uh, suspect and bad certificates out there. What do we do? So with Mr. St. George uh, being adjudicated as guilty and being sentenced to, uh, to federal prison, uh, we started up a, uh, a retesting program in Orlando. And the, very, uh, the beginning of that program was to reach out and find these people through the uh, airman records that we had on them call them back in, retest them properly to the did, certification Did standards. you find them all? Well, no. What happened was we were in the process of doing it. Uh, we had located uh, a little over 300, almost 400 of them, actually. And out of those 400, about 80% of them were not able to demonstrate uh, their ability to uh, comply with the standards for certification. So what I mean by that is that uh, out of those almost 400, we, there was a great number of them that once they received a letter from us that we wanted to retest them, they just voluntarily surrendered their certificates. They realized, okay, I've been caught. This is a criminal enterprise. I don't want to get any closer to this. So they mailed their certificates back. Then there were a number of folks that came in and actually went through the retesting process and just couldn't pass the retesting process. And some of them we never heard from, so we started an administrative process of suspending and then ultimately revoking the certificates. So out of that mix of activity, only about 20% of those first 400 that we contacted were able to actually demonstrate their competency to hold that certificate. So did FAA remove the ones who were still in, in positions of uh, uh, doing mechanic work? Well, what happened was um, as we had this test, uh, this testing, retesting program started, um, the FAA decided uh, that they were going to cancel the retesting program. 
We had a new associate administrator for aviation safety come in by the name of Nicholas Sabatini, and he decided he didn't want the program going on. So I was given the word that we were not going to test these people anymore, and the retesting program was going to be shut down. What would you do? Well, I protested. Uh, I, I gave all the arguments for why that should not be done because of the... Uh, Who did you protest to? <clears throat> well, not only to him, but also to the uh, individuals that he named to come and deliver the message to me. But it was falling on deaf ears. The program was shut down. Um, and uh, the testing stopped. So this was one of the uh, safety disclosures that I made to the Office of Special Counsel. Tell me about that. Well, it turned out to be a real interesting exercise. Um, the, because the program was shut down, the retesting program, which even though we were experiencing a high rate of failures among this population, the program got shut down in uh, 2001, the spring of 2001, uh, over my protests. Uh, since I uh, wasn't having any success in, in uh, getting the FAA to understand the importance of this, I filed a safety disclosures with the Office of Special Counsel officially in uh, June of 2002. And um, it then took another two years for the um, disclosures to work their way through the system, through the labyrinth that the disclosures go to take a look at what's going on. So about three years after the program was shut down, with all of these people out there not being addressed now, finally we got a determination from the Office of Special Counsel and from the Department of Transportation Inspector General's office that the retesting program should have never been stopped. So you won? Well, not really. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like it. And, and, and um, the Office of Special Counsel kind of advertised it that way. Like, say, okay, we got this information from whistleblower. We have a win here. And we did. But what really happened was that uh, the FAA was basically told you need to restart this and you have to retest these people. And the FAA didn't like that news. Okay, there were personalities that had, were vested in not letting this happen. They didn't want this kind of thing going on on their watch. So um, they devised a scheme to get around before retesting. So, okay, well, we're being told that we have to retest, but we're the FAA and we have discretion to do the testing however we want. So what they ultimately did was gutted the testing that you would normally go through to get original certification. They el totally eliminated the practical portion of the test. And what that means is that everybody that they retested afterwards never had to demonstrate any sort of mechanical ability at all in a practical sense, which is a big part of the regular certification. They also took the written test and the oral portion of the test, where you're asked questions, and they severely cut those down. As an example, with the oral portion of the exam, when you go for certification as a mechanic, you get asked a minimum of about 172 questions that you have to thoroughly explore and explain. Well, they cut it down to five questions. And depending on if it was, five, if it was uh, you were going for your airframe portion, there were five questions there. If you were going for your power plant portion, there were five questions So there. essentially they gutted the recertification uh, yeah. process. And what was happening to you during this time? Well, during this time, uh, I was undergoing what uh, has become a common story among whistleblowers. Uh, I was put under investigation. Uh, by whom? By uh, Sabatini, and uh, he ordered an investigation of me, and it was all false allegations. You know, they send uh, some security folks in. This is going to be a very familiar story to some of the people that are listening to this. Um, and they go in and they intimidate folks in the office, and they start to gin up allegations that are not true, and, and uh, then they act on those allegations. They take action on you. And all the while this is going on, you're being denied the right to have any kind of legal representation. So um, I got removed from my job as a manager, and I was reassigned a non-management position to the uh, runway safety uh, program in the southern region. So it was a demotion. Uh, it was um, a loss of my management uh, career, which I was very good at. Uh, this was something that I excelled in. I had been a manager uh, in the FAA for over half my career. At this point, I was in the FAA. And your career was 29 years? Yeah, well, at that point, it was 26 years, yeah. And, um, I mean, um, I had uh, taken a number of problems that existed in the FAA and was successful in fixing them. I had been given awards for manager of the year, running the office of the year, and all that sort of thing. But none of that really meant anything. 
when it came to uh, getting involved with trying to pro fix a problem that the FAA wanted to keep uh, quiet. So I suffered what most uh, whistleblowers suffer through. Um, You're retired now? Yeah, I'm retired now. Um, 28 years in the FAA, two years military time, so 30 years federal service. And um, regrets about having come forward with this information? I get asked that question a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, of course there are a certain amount of regrets. Um, I have to say probably if, if my job was not safety related, where lives could, could depend on decisions that were made, if, for example, I worked for, not to demean the IRS, for example, but if I worked for the IRS, and it was a situation where, oh, somebody got caught cheating on their taxes, well, I'd find some remedies for that. Nobody's going to die over that. I don't know that it will put my well-being and my family's well-being uh, in jeopardy for that sort of thing. But when you're talking about safety issues in people's lives, uh, I, when I think about it again, I realize that um, uh, in a way I didn't have any choice. It's just something I had to do. So I did it, and uh, the rest is all documented in reams of documents. And just to put our, uh, our minds at ease, perhaps, uh, do we have any reason to be more confident that the FAA is on the job today? Well, there's a number of issues with the FAA today. Um, uh, the, uh, out of the 90-day uh, safety review that I mentioned earlier, one of the recommendations that came out of that was to come up with a new oversight system so that we wouldn't get into a value jet situation again. What that really meant was that at that point in time, there were a number of discount carriers that were emerging uh, in the airline industry. And the way they were being handled and certified was very, very loose. So the 90-day safety review uh, produced recommendations to come up with an oversight system to prevent that in the future. Well, they uh, ultimately wound up labeling that the Air Transportation Oversight System, ATOS. And this was a system that was designed to be applied to all of the discount carriers that were uh, now entering uh, into service. But what happened was when they wheeled this ATOS program out a couple of years after all of this happened, they didn't apply it to the discount carriers. They took it and they applied it to the major legacy carriers in the United States, you know, the uh, United Americans, TWAs and so forth. And uh, it was never used as, as it was intended to use, be used. Mm -hmm. So, um, and to this day, uh, the ATOS program has really created an internal empire in the FAA for jobs and grades and so forth, but does little to nothing in terms of providing a real actual oversight of safety issues. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we're going to have to do it quickly, though. Okay. Um, the, uh, the reason I say that is because all of the things that you've seen happen recently, uh, all of the disclosures that have happened recently, the... Uh, uh, the hearings that were held in Congress last year about Southwest and American Airlines, none of these things were found by the ATOS program. They were found by whistleblowers. So the ATOS program has not provided any safety information in terms of here's a problem we can fix. All of those problems that you see coming to light in the media and the public today are problems that are identified by whistleblowers that are putting themselves on the line to identify the problems and fix them, not the FAA's program. Whistleblowers like Gabe Bruno, I might add, uh, many thanks to Gabe for his work on behalf of public safety. And if the mechanics that are working uh, in the industry today are uh, qualified, uh, you can thank Gabe in part for that. Uh, I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work.